As Kenton mentioned, we're in week two of Unhurry Your Life. And last week, Joel kicked us off by basically uh, telling us that we're all sick. He was quite the delight, wasn't he? No. But uh, we talked about John Mark Comer. He's author and pastor. His uh, definition of hurry sickness was this. It's a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and to get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. We talked about how life is just this rat race constantly coming and going and never actually getting anywhere. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. There's hope in the fact that if we look at what the Bible calls the Sabbath, and it takes us from being um, just production workers to being present, that moment of being able to just be, and the fact that maybe our work will always remain incomplete, but we're still loved anyways. It's okay to slow down and rest. So how many of you like peace and quiet and sleeping doesn't count? Okay, okay. How many of you actually uh, kind of dread the thought of complete silence? Okay, see, I knew there were people out there. But in our fast-paced world, and I know for myself, I'm constantly saying, like, can you just give me a minute? Like, I just need a minute to breathe. Well, if you're like me this morning, you're going to get your minute. So how many of you felt your anxiety kind of rising in that moment, right? Like we say we want quiet, but we don't actually know what to do when there is nothing. Um, If you're like, I mean, maybe some of you busted out your cell phone, like that's what I tend to do when there's nothing. It's like this endless treasure chest of just uh, scrolling and things to do, games on your phone. But, uh, you know, I think about, like, what did I used to do when I was sitting in the drive through line waiting for my order or waiting at the doctor's office? You know, nothing. That's what we used to do. We used to do nothing. But now, uh, nowadays, most of us can't even stay present in a whole minute of silence. Um, experts actually, a study from Microsoft actually uh, says that our attention span used to be 12 seconds in the year 2000, and now it's eight seconds. In comparison, scientists have said that a goldfish actually has an attention span of nine seconds. So if I had a goldfish up here on stage with me today, it would actually be able to hang with me uh, longer than you will. So I'm just going to go because. St- I don't even know if you're going to be able to stay with me for this whole talk, right? But uh, all kidding aside, like, reality is many of us will do just about anything to avoid being still and being quiet. And the problem with all of that, Comer warns, is that this new normal of hurried digital distraction is robbing us of the ability to be present, present to God, present to other people, present to all that is good, beautiful, and true in our world, even present to our own souls. And so when a minute of silence is forced upon us, it gets a little uncomfy because we don't know what to do. But what if the reality is that there are only things that we can experience when we stop and slow down 
and get quiet? What if solitude and silence are the only place where we can actually discover God? So before we keep going, we need to talk about what actually is solitude, right? But you may have heard of fasting. Uh, some of you may have done this before a medical procedure. It's the absence of food. Uh, it tends to make us a little hangry sometimes. But uh, Jesus followers look at fasting as a way to, um, and prayer in conjunction together to focus on God. And solitude is similar. It's not the absence of food necessarily, but it's the absence of noise and distraction and people. And we tend to put silence and solitude together, kind of like, um, you know, macaroni and cheese, peanut butter and chocolate. They just go together so great that, you know, it was just meant to be. Yeah, most of my illustrations are generally food. That's just how I live my life. Um, but we can... Um, fill our eyes and our ears with so much noise that sometimes we can't see or hear the one voice that we are supposed to hear the most. We actually, at our house, we even turn the Alexa radio on for our anxious dog, okay? That's real life. Like, that's how much noise we have in our life. Um, but we have every convenience to fill our eyes and our ears um, instead of being able to slow down and focus. But solitude isn't just important for us in our modern day uh, culture. It was important for Jesus too. And at the beginning of his public ministry, Luke uh, is a physician and author who looked at uh, Jesus's life. He gave us insight into how Jesus practiced solitude. He said, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. I find it super interesting that the first thing that Jesus did when he was starting his public ministry was to go out into the wilderness alone for 40 days. If I had been Jesus's career counselor, I probably would have suggested a little different approach, maybe like creating some buzz, getting some hype around what you're trying to do, maybe go viral on TikTok, do this like water into wine miracle, maybe start like a walking on water challenge or something, like that's how you get this buzz going here. But before any miracle, teaching, healing, anything happened, Jesus went off for 40 days in the wilderness by himself. Now, it mentioned that uh, he returned, uh, you know, quite hungry. And I can imagine 40 minutes without food for me uh, creates a problem. So 40 days, no food, fasting, he's real hungry and tired, you guys. Nothing good would come out of that for me, but for Jesus, that is the solitude and the silence refreshed him. It filled him. That's where his strength and his power to be able to start his ministry came from. It wasn't from the noise and all of that that we tend to fill our lives with. It makes me think about when we have a pro or a, like a project or an adventure that we're about to go on, right? What do we typically do? Start with solitude? No. We get on the internet, we research every single possible scenario, we uh, ask our friends, our family, look at experts, what have they done so we get some experience, we listen to podcasts, we you know, watch videos, we want to get all the information, but I wonder what might happen if we did. Because solitude wasn't just a one-time practice for Jesus. It was a regular occurrence, a pattern, because it was important uh, in his life. So a chapter later, Luke, in Luke's gospel, he tells us that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. The Greek can actually be translated to was regularly withdrawing and praying. He frequently felt the need to go off and be with God. In fact, Luke records with uh, Jesus withdrawing into solitary nine times. And you might think, well, I guess Jesus is an introvert. That's just who he was. 
I don't think so. I mean, some of you are introverts out there. You're not going to like shout back at me, but I see you. I am also an introvert. Yes, even though I am up here doing this this morning, I am an introvert too. But I don't think this pattern says that Jesus was an introvert or an extrovert just because he saw the importance of solitude. He knew that in order to carry out the work that the Father had sent him to do, he needed to regularly withdraw to be with him. Which begs the question, if Jesus felt the need to often withdraw to be with the Father, shouldn't we? Like, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. I don't know about you, but theologian William Barclay once said, it may well be that the whole trouble in our lives is that we give God no opportunity to speak to us because we do not know how to be still and to listen. We give God no time to recharge us with spiritual energy and strength because there is no time when we wait upon him. How can we shoulder life's burdens if we have no contact with him who is the Lord of all good life? You guys, Jesus often withdrew to hear the voice of God, to be strengthened, to carry out his mission. And yet maybe you're thinking, well, Jesus didn't have a smartphone. He didn't have kids travel ball schedules. He didn't have a boss that be, uh, you know, demands that he's available 24-7. I don't, how can I possibly have time to be still and listen? Yet I would counter that Jesus lived under constant demands. In fact, the gospel writer Mark uh, records one snapshot from Jesus's life where he and the disciples were so busy that they didn't have time to eat, like not even time to run through the local Taco Bell, you guys. I don't understand this life, but Mark tells us that Jesus had been feeding 5,000 people, and because so many people had been coming and going, that Jesus and the disciples didn't have time to feed themselves. Now, you know you're busy when you start missing meals. Maybe some of you have been there. Uh, you know, that's not typically my life because, again, I already mentioned every 40 minutes I have to have a snack. Um, but maybe you've missed an appointment. Maybe you forgot to pick a kid up from practice because you're so busy going here, there, and everywhere. Maybe you're like me and took your dog to the vet on Friday and walked out without paying because you were already thinking about the next thing you were going to do. Yeah, that's real life. But there are so many things going on in in our brains that we can't keep it all straight and it is so overwhelming but look at how Jesus responds during this demanding time then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat he said to them come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest he recognizes the need to get away. Let's go off by ourselves and rest. In fact, the busier Jesus got, the more intentional he was about spending time with God in solitude. Now, it's not an easy practice, this solitude thing, because there will always be needs and demands and distractions and people but the regular practice of solitude that gave Jesus energy and strength to love people the way he loved them and to serve people the way he served them, you can have that too. Bless you. Because this is what happens in the practice of solitude. We slow down to hear the voice of God. Now there are countless voices trying to get your attention every single day. Distractions that compete for the limited space in our brains, in our minds. Did you know there's actually a part of your brain that is designed to filter out the noise? It's called sensory gating, okay? So, for example, if everyone in this room turned, we're not going to do this, but if everyone turned to their neighbor and started to have a conversation, if you are normal, you would be able to focus on the conversation in front of you. You don't actually have to actively like block out the noise around you. Your brain does that for you as a way to protect you from becoming overwhelmed. 
This is not going to come as a shock to anyone that knows me at all, but I am not normal, okay? My brain no longer gatekeeps for me. And so if we are at a restaurant together and we are having a conversation, I hear everything. And this is not a blessing, it's a curse, let me tell you, because I don't care about so-and-so's medical procedures. I don't care what you think about your in-laws. I don't want to hear about the spoilers to the latest show that I haven't had the chance to watch yet. And I especially hate it when I hear something that's not true because it takes everything inside of me not to turn around and be like, that's a lie. Okay, I don't want to hear everything, but my brain is overwhelmed. I did not realize this. I thought it was a normal thing once I became a mom and I had to be in tune to hearing puke in the middle of the night. I thought that's just who I was as a person. But after doing some research for this, not true. That's just a lie I've been telling myself. Apparently, my brain is super overwhelmed and so it has stopped gatekeeping for me. So let me explain it kind of another way. If I had a wheelbarrow up here 100 years ago, that wheelbarrow uh, had to carry one pound loads right? No smartphone, no travel ball schedules, no emails, podcasts, none of that. One pound loads. Today's wheelbarrow carries like a hundred pound loads. It basically has an engine on it that's all, bra all gas and no brake all the time. We are just constantly going, constantly humming. But with all the noise in our world, we run the risk of drowning out that one voice that is trying to get our attention. It's not that when we slow down, we tune out his voice, we turn down the noise. God's saying, I have been here the whole time. I'm glad that you can finally hear me. Slowing down also doesn't mean that you're wasting time or missing out like the world would try to tell you that it does. Empty space does not always need to be filled. And that took me a long time, like 40 years and an extended quarantine to realize that the empty space doesn't need to be filled. It's okay. And last week, Joel mentioned that Sabbath is a rebellion to the busyness of life that we are human beings and not human doings, okay? So here is a challenge for you. What could it look like if we were people who reclaimed the spaces of silence as an act of rebellion in our daily lives? You guys, make the space rebel against the norm. And I'm a challenger, so this rebelling, that's easy for me, okay? It may be harder for some of you, but rebel against the norm because not only do we hear the voice of God in solitude, we are refreshed in solitude. If we don't take the time to be alone with God, the voices that are constantly telling us that we're not good enough, that we're not measuring up as a spouse, as a parent, as a coworker, as a friend, they get louder. And the voice that says, you are my beloved, I love you, gets quieter. And if our minds and our schedules are so full, that there's no room for God to speak life-giving, soul-refreshing, like heart-filling words to us, then those voices that tell us we're not measuring up, they are going to fill us. But sometimes I feel like I'm not experiencing life to the full that Jesus offers me. Full life, yes. Life to the full, not so much. Okay, and maybe you're the same, but could that be the reason that I'm not experiencing all he has for me? Not because he's absent, but because I can't hear him and I'm not listening. Jesus got so much done in the three years of his ministry. He had people wanting his attention all the time. Jesus, heal me. Jesus, come visit me. Jesus, can you talk to me? Jesus, come here. He, yet he always found time to be alone with God, to be quiet. He knew that that intimate relationship with the Father would restore him and refresh him spiritually. You guys, life can sometimes leave us 
crashed and crushed and just feeling overwhelmed, like we don't know what to do, but it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus can refresh you. He can restore you, but we have to invite him to do so. We have to give him space to be able to do that in our lives. So how can we incorporate solitude into our own 21st century uh, chaotic lives? Let me be clear, but what I'm about to tell you is a struggle also for me. And it's going to take some practice. And as the great philosopher Alan Iverson once said, we in here talking about practice, man? And for some of you that don't know sports, that's a joke, okay? Alan Iverson played for the 76ers, and in 2002, he went on this rant about practice when somebody questioned his dedication to the team, and he used the word practice more than 20 times in this short little rant. I didn't count the number of times that I'm about to say practice, but hopefully you'll get the idea, okay? Now, fair warning, you may not be great at solitude at first, and I, uh, this is another thing, you're learning a lot about me today, but something that uh, you may not know about me is I don't like to do things that I'm not great at the first time, like bowling. Like, why doesn't the ball just go where I'm looking? I will never understand how that works. But this is going to take some practice. It's not always going to be easy. That one minute of silence, for some of you, you would have rather died in your seat than sat there for a whole minute in your chair, okay? But keep practicing at these things I'm about to tell you. Like put up the, you know, gutter bumper things when you go bowling, like that may be what you have to do at first <laughs> for this whole practice thing, but what does refresh you? What does fill you? What does work for you to allow God to be able to come close and near to you? Every day provides numerous opportunities for us to practice simple moments of solitude. Okay, there are moments in our days where we make the intentional choice to be present to God over the noise and the distractions. This can look like maybe your morning coffee. Maybe instead of scrolling on your phone or having the morning news on, you just sit with God and talk to him about your upcoming day. Maybe it looks like, uh, you know, quiet time on a park bench while you're watching your kids play on the playground. Maybe a simple moment of solitude for you can be like taking a walk, but without having your earbuds in, being able to just soak in the, si the sights and the sounds that are around you. Simple moments can be like looking out the window maybe it, it, when you're a passenger in the car the next time instead of burying your face in the phone. Maybe it can look like turning the radio off in your car. And this one might seem weird, but this one's actually my favorite thing to do. Now, the drive from my house to the church is only six minutes, but when, it's from, when I'm in there by myself, the radio's off. It's my time where I can focus I can pray, I can talk to God about my day, but there's no distraction. It's where I try to focus before I even start my day. And you might be thinking, oh, 12 minutes in a 24-hour day? That's so long, Allison. No, you guys, if I'm in the car by myself, the radio's off. Now, my youngest daughter will often get in when I pick her up from practice, and she's kind of like... Can I turn this up? Like, is it okay that we turn? She doesn't appreciate silence yet, you guys. One day she will, one day. But simple moments of solitude can also be practicing breath prayers. And maybe this is a foreign concept for you, or maybe you've heard of breath prayers before. They're simple truths. Maybe they're short scripture for you to kind of meditate on and it's as easy as taking a breath. And I know you go throughout your day breathing, so I know this is something that we can all do. But when I breathe in, I'll say, like, your grace. And then when I breathe out, I'll say, is enough for me. But sometimes, you guys, I need a deep breath, and I don't have time for all of that. Sometimes I have a deep breath, and I'm just like, Lord, help me. Or Lord, guide me. Use me. It's just breathing in and breathing out. 
So now we've come to the lab portion of this lecture this morning. Do you remember that from school where you learn something and then you practice it? Yeah, that's about to happen, okay? But it's gonna be super easy. Nobody's getting called up front. I'm not asking for volunteers. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't even have to answer anything. You literally just have to take two deep breaths. Can we handle that? Okay, so you can either say to yourself, this is all inside your head, remember? But we're going to breathe in. You can say, your grace is enough for me. When you breathe out, you can say whatever you might want to say. You might say, this lady is insane. And that's okay. <laughs> whatever it is, you're still going to take two deep breaths this morning. Are you ready? Okay, first one. When was the last time you guys took a deep cleansing refreshing, slowed down breath. It's probably been a minute, if I'm guessing. But imagine doing that over and over while you're driving in your car or while you're waiting at the drive-thru or at the doctor's office or the school pickup line. You guys, here's the thing. I'm pretty sure you're going to go through your day breathing, right? So this is an easy one that you can do, a breath prayer to draw you closer to God, even if it's just 30 seconds or a minute. Our days are filled with numerous opportunities to practice simple moments of solitude, but I also want to challenge you to do some set times of solitude. Now, Jesus was intentional about getting away to a quiet place, and we can imitate him by having these set times of solitude. Now, I don't know most of you, but uh, what I assume about you is that you think that the person that is up here suggesting things or telling you what to do is perfect at the thing that they are suggesting to you. Well, I'm about to just blow that all to pieces because I am not great at most of these things that I am going to challenge you with. They're a challenge for me too. You guys, we are in this together. <laughs> but in the weeks leading up to this talk, I have been practicing all of these things. And I can promise you that if you are intentional about them, God will meet you in these spaces. So here are a few things that I have found helpful in practicing these set times of solitude. First, pick a place. Maybe it's a particular chair or a room in your home. Maybe it's your driver's seat. Maybe it's the furthest seat away from people in the staff lounge or, you know, wherever you work. Maybe it's in the shower. Seriously, you guys, I've lived the new mom, like, toddler life, baby life. Like, I know sometimes that is the only place that you are going to actually be alone, alone uh, for the whole day. And sometimes not even then, okay? But alone time is a limited resource. Find a place where you can be alone, alone, not just kind of alone. Then figure out what works for you, but pick a time during the day. If you're a morning person, maybe you set an alarm for 30 minutes earlier so that way you have some quiet time before the busyness of the day. Maybe you're more of a night owl, but you set a time when the TV and the phone go off so that way you're able to spend intentional time with God. Maybe you have you know, the ability during your lunch break or maybe you get a 15 minute break at work or something where you're able to, instead of scrolling on your phones, be intentional about spending some time with God. Here's what I don't want. Next week, I don't want you to come up to me and be like, I just, I don't know how you do it. I just didn't have any time. Because if we are both being honest with each other, we will both know that that is not true. <laughs> because you make time for the things that are important for you. And this, you guys, should be important for you. Finding time to be alone with God should be one of the most important things that we do during our day. So take the time, make the time, 
pick a time that works for you. And then my third suggestion is to pick a plan. Now, this could be uh, the Bible app on your phone. Maybe it's a devotional you actually have in your hand or a book you're reading um, in your hand so you can highlight things and make notes. Maybe it's opening up your Bible for the very first time or in a very long time. And as a side note, if you don't have a Bible and you would want one that you actually have in your hand, let me know. I would be happy and honored to get you one. Now back. Um, that's not to say there won't be days where God totally blows up your moment of solitude, your moment of silence, because he has something else that he's leading you to. There have been many times where in my quiet time, you know, somebody has walked in or somebody has, you know, something has gotten in the way of me being able to be quiet. I don't look at that anymore, <laughs> I used to, like a distraction or like they were an interruption or like it was a bother, okay? I know that there are always reasons why somebody has walked in, why that person has come to my mind or why, you know, I have felt the need to go to that place or that person uh, during what would be my moment of solitude. But be present to his leading and you will be more in tune to that if you get this practice of solitude. But all of these practices, these simple moments of solitude and these set times of solitude, just provide the space for us to slow down and hear the voice of God and to be refreshed in solitude. Because theologian and author uh, Henry Nouwen said it best in his book, Making All Things New. He says, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and listen to him. You guys, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. 